Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Virtual Counterculture with Cheeses of Austria. Actually, the full name is Europe Home of Cheese, Cheeses of Austria. My name is Susan Axelrod, and I'm the editor of Culture, and I'm very pleased to be with you today to introduce you to some cheeses that may be lesser known to many of us. They were certainly lesser known to me, and I hope you have your samples ready. I've got mine right here on my little board, uh, room temperature, warmed up, ready to taste. We have the Grinsink and the um, Mosbacher and the Bergkasse. And Thomas will tell me in a moment if I've said those correctly. So our presenter today is Thomas Gasteiner. And Thomas is a cheese expert that has been in the industry for more than 20 years. He has been working uh, to market uh, Austrian cheeses since 2009, um, using his in-depth knowledge and background to promote Austrian cheese. He's been in the hospitality industry as well and the culinary arts world. Uh, he is the culinary arts director at the tourism school in Simmering, Austria. And he's coming to us uh, at 10 o'clock at night from Austria um, a thousand meters above sea level. Um, Thomas also founded the first cheese association in Austria. So before we get started, uh, those of you who've done these before, you know the drill, but for those of you who might be new, a few housekeeping uh, reminders. Please use the chat feature or the Q&A to ask your questions. We will answer some of them as we can during the presentation, but there will also be 10 minutes for a dedicated Q&A time um, at the end of the session. So we've got a lot of really interesting material to get through this afternoon, and I can't wait to hear what Thomas has to say. So without further ado, Thomas, please take it away. Yeah, thank you very much, Susan, and uh, good evening from Austria and good afternoon in the United States. It's really a pleasure for me to promote the Austrian cheeses uh, tonight or to af this afternoon. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a pleasure and it's also, I hope, interesting for you to hear something about our cheese history, about cheese making in Austria, about cheese specialities and all that. We just go through it and, of course, if there are questions, please go on and ask and of course um, um yeah it's uh susan said already i'm the culinary arts director of the tourism school but i also worked in america uh in texas once but this is 30 years ago so please excuse me just now if there are some words maybe i pronounced wrong it's 30 years ago but i'm usually once or twice in america every year at, especially in new york for the fancy food show and present austin cheeses and wine there I'm also a wine and cheese sommelier in Austria. And uh, yeah, I hope we go through this and have fun together and, and learn something from Austria. Good, here you see a little bit about uh, the topics we have today, about yeah, the history of Austrian cheese. Then of course, just a little bit about the cheese production, some typical things about Austrian cheese production, then uh, the most uh, famous types of cheeses in Austria, then, uh, of course, the virtual tasting, and then, of course, we have time for questions. Before we start with uh, the history of cheese, I just want to give you an overview about uh, the Austrian cheese sommeliers and, and what we do in Austria since now really a long time, because it started about 30 years ago that uh, Austrian companies uh, sent the first materials to school, how to degustate cheese, how to cut cheeses, sent videos those days. And it really started about 30 years ago. And then, of course, it go was going on and on and on. And um, now we have some extra courses for interested people in cheese. For example, what we, what we do, what we offer uh, for the cheese education is a cheese sommelier course for adults. This course takes two and a half years, so it's quite a long time. We know that, but it's very important for us uh, that they not just learn somewhere, uh, like in, in school or somewhere else, that they really go out to the companies in Austria, really from the West to the East, see these companies, see the production there, see the specific uh, themes about these cheeses and so on. And that's the reason why it takes two and a half years. And we have a smaller program for really students in tourism schools in Austria, which takes uh, 40 hours. 
uh, in uh, during one year, education and school. And in this 40 hours, of course, it's the same thing like for the adults, but of course, not such in, 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 in a big way like that. Uh, so it's a little bit uh, smaller for them and not so complicated. It all ends up both educations uh, with uh, three diploma exams. They have to do a written exam for the adults for two year, two hours, for the students for one hour. Then they have to degustate five cheeses. That means they have to describe them like we do it today a little bit, give uh, really examples for wine pairing, beer pairing, bread pairing, and so on. And after that, they have a practical exam. Uh, they have to organize a cheese trolley with minimum 15 different cheeses. And then they go, uh, they present these cheeses, of course, and not just present them from the cheese trolley. They also have to show us uh, sales techniques, carving techniques, and uh, then it's a technical talk. So altogether, uh, it takes half a day for this exam, but then they are really Austrian cheese sommeliers. And... It's really important for our industry and especially for uh, the culinary arts industry, of course, for hotels, restaurants. If you have such a diploma, uh, you have a, a big benefit in the market, of course. Yeah, how I really came into this story was uh, 2008. I just want to show you one thing because in Austria, we have uh, cheese sommeliers of the year once a year and wine sommeliers of the year. This is usually, yeah, it, it's uh, like a, a battle. It's a competition. Uh, really for two days, everything about cheeses all over the world and so on and so on. And uh, I won this 2008 and I just want to show you because I think it's fun. I hope you can see it. It's a little bit, of course, like the Oscar nominees, you know, these trophies, but it's just that we have this uh, cheese love here in, in the hands and that's what I won 2008 and uh, cheese so many of the year in Austria. And since that time, the AMA marketing, I will just explain it in, in one sentence later, uh, sends me around the world a little bit. And uh, yeah, I'm really very proud that I'm able to promote Austrian cheeses. Okay, uh, let me just say one word about the agriculture market Austria. AMA is just a short term of it. What are they doing? Uh, AMA has the legal obligation to develop and implement various quality assurance programs in order to guarantee the highest quality of agriculture products. And the second legal obligation is to inform people about agriculture in Austria and its products. And of course, we are more or less uh, then around like on the fancy food show and present the Austrian cheese and the Austrian world. And it's for me always interesting in New York to discuss it with uh, restaurant owners and the restaurant managers from New York and um, the surroundings uh, about Austrian cheese and culture. It's so funny. Uh, sometimes they are not really exactly sure where we are, but if I tell them Europe and if I tell them Arnold Schwarzenegger and Mozart, then it's okay. Then we have no problem at all. And then I can talk about my beautiful country and about the cheeses. So that was just about the AMA marketing in, in one sentence. And now just a little bit about the history. So uh, the history of, of Austrian cheese really began about 2,500 years ago. And um, if you see on, on the next slide, please, European um, authenticity and Austrian identity. So you can see exactly that Europe is really the home of cheese. I mean, just think about which really famous cheeses come from Europe. Just if you think about France, like Brie and Camembert and Roquefort, Italy with Parmesan and Grana Padano and so on and so on, Borgonzola, there are so many just around our country. And of course, also our cheese history and production is influenced especially from Italian and Swiss cheese because they are neighbors, they are next to us, next border. So uh, the Austrian history is old, more than 2,500 years old. And we know from, uh, we know that uh, especially the Northmans, for sure, Norwegians, uh, Danish, Swedish, brought about 2,500 years ago, the cheese culture uh, to Austria. And then we learned a lot from Swiss people, especially Alpine cheese and Bergkäse, um, which we will taste today, which will be the third one today. Uh, comes this technique to make Berg and mountain cheese comes from really from Swiss, from Switzerland. And they learned how to make out of a, yeah, a liquid out of this milk, really a product which is durable for years. And this is really mostly 
the technique how to do it and then of course a lot of souls especially yeah europe the home of cheese um cheese is more than just a staple of european diet it's central to the european identity of course and then it speaks of history tracing centuries of heritage and know-how that means um yeah what i said before that really since centuries uh, we do it more or less the same way, especially these traditional cheeses like uh, Emmentaler, you would say Swiss, and uh, this Bergkäse. Yeah, then it speaks of places um, as each cheese is, for example, the unique climate we have in Austria. You know that 70% of Austria is really covered with mountains, more or less, and then we have some small cities compared to your cities like Vienna and Salzburg. But uh, uh, the climate is so different. In the very west parts of Austria, it's really freezing in winter, and it's even in the summertime not too hot. But in the east parts, so near the, the Hungarian border, it can be very hot. And in the south parts of Austria, it's in Carinthia, it's in the, the, the borders of Hungary, Slovenia, and, and Italy. It can be like Mediterranean uh, flair yeah, and be very hot. So it's really extreme. And that's the reason why in our small country, we have really specialities all over, but I explain it then on the landscape of Austria, which I want to show you. Yeah, it speaks of people, the dairy men and women, uh, yeah, who uphold their family farms day after day, and they do this since centuries and centuries in Europe. And this is so special. I've seen it in, in many places, especially in the west parts of Austria. Maybe you heard about Tirol, you say Tyrol, uh, Vorarlberg, and Salzburg is more or less west. When you go up there to the mountains and you go there to just a wooden house, usually all of them in the mountains are producing cheeses. And you just knock on the door, go in, and even if they work, if they produce cheese, no problem, come in, have a glass of uh, raw milk, and then they will serve you some cheese. You can buy the cheese there. So really, for me, identic, and this is so special for Austria, same in Switzerland, more or less, yeah, but that you really go there, to the to the farms to the family business and buy the cheese there yeah, so really small amounts i think that makes the european authentic authenticity and the austrian identity so special good then we go to the next slide like the this alpine cheese which is for me the most typical one we have alpine cheese and we have mountain cheese more or less there is a little bit of difference uh, for example, in Austria, if we really name it mountain cheese, it means that the cows have to be up there in the mountains. Yeah? But of course, the whole process of cheese making may be down in a small town or in a small city. But the, the cows have to be up there, up to the mountains, and yeah, really be fed by fresh grass, have the beautiful air up there, and so on. But the Alpine cheese is the most special because everything has to be or has to be made on the Alpine himself. That means the cows must be there. Uh, the milk has to be stored there, up there in the mountains. And the milk has to be produced. And the cheese has to be produced and stored up there in the mountains. And I think for me, this is the best quality you can find. Yeah? That means everything handmade, raw milk, stored up there and then you can sell it of course uh, in the cities down there but everything has every step for cheese making uh, have to be there up there by this alpine cheese yeah alpine cheese uh, just that you see here a little bit uh, from uh, the history you can read here that more or less from the stone age people created sour milk cheeses already and then later the romans introduced the production, fermentation, and new tradition to Austria's cheese making. So the Romans brought us, of course, especially uh, vinification, winemaking all over Austria, especially around Vienna, let's say it like this. But they also brought us the cheese making. And this is, of course, exactly the other parts of Austria and the very best parts of Austria. Okay. And uh, yeah, then uh, from, the, uh, from the tradition here, you see Alpine cheese has a long tradition in the land of the Alps, of course, and Alpine cheese could therefore be described as concentrated Alpine milk. It takes up to 15 liters of milk to produce one kilo of hard cheese, like with all these hard cheeses. It is like this, as you know, but that's a, yeah, a high amount, of course, to produce one kilo of cheese. Good. 
then committed to nature um important that you I, I will explain it then a little bit on the landscape as well that you understand uh, our small country we have just eight million people living in austria but uh, we have still a lot of uh, dairies a lot of uh, family business and as you can see 22 dairy cows per family business this is very small i remember i was once in wisconsin uh, we were there on, on a seminar and uh, yeah, we had some cheese degustations in Wisconsin, and they showed us farms that had more than 10,000 cows, 15,000 cows, I think, so really big. And in Austria, it's exactly uh, the other way around. So very small farms, a lot of family business, not many big companies like Bergamilch, what you heard maybe, or other companies. Yeah, we have more than uh, 450 varieties of cheese. We are very proud of that. Because again, small country, not so much space, but um, a lot of uh, producers who really have great people working in their companies, thinking about recipes, working with a lot of herbs and flowers. I explain it later, uh, and uh, yeah, a lot of uh, experimental things which are, I think, interesting. I remember this year at the Fancy Food Show, we had a cheese uh, with carrot slides on top, with hay flour on top then with some chili and so on. And what I recognize is that really the restaurant owners and so on from, from New York really were very interested in that because I think this is not so common in the United States. Yeah? But as you can see, 450 varieties of cheese, especially in Austria, uh, cow milk cheese, of course. Around 88% of the all over, overall production in Austria is cow milk cheese. The rest is especially uh, sheep cheese and goat cheese. And yeah, that's it more or less. Uh, nothing, nothing fancy, nothing fancy, no camel cheese or something in Austria, but especially cow milk. That's the tradition in Austria. Down there, where you see these three, three mountains, you can see that 70% of the Austrian territory is mountains. I think we are well known for that, of course. Skiing in Austria is well known all over the world. I hope <laughs> that you know that. And that's the reason why, of course, we have a lot of uh, mountain and alpine cheeses in Austria. And 85% of the land in Austria is supported by an environmental measure. So nature is really uh, important for us. And it's important also for, for all the, uh, the tourism in Austria, for the hotel industry in Austria. Because as you know, or I hope you know that Austria is a really, it's a real tourist country. And more or less, yeah, it's, it's, it's one of the most important factors or yeah, in, in Austria that we have a lot of tourists and that we live from tourists in Austria. It's very important, I think. Okay, then we go please to the next slide already. The three styles of Austrian cheese. And I just wanna explain this Austrian landscape a little bit to you. So the three styles of Austrian cheeses are soft cheese, semi-hard cheese, and hard cheese, especially. Um, for uh, the soft cheese, what I wanna tell you, which is something really special, all over Europe more or less, but really very special in Austria, are the soft cheeses aged one week to three months, and they are mostly produced and stored in monasteries. I've seen it many times. It's, you know, I thought the first time when I was there, a little bit romantic that I go there and I see the monks running around producing cheese, selling cheese, that's not true, of course, anymore. Yeah, it's really like mostly all the other companies, but it's really situated in, in monasteries and they produce beautiful red culture cheeses and really very rich cheeses. I love them, but all for the, all the young people, if I, you know, we have these uh, cheese cores, of course, in my school here in Semmering. I, I think I didn't explain it exactly. Semmering is a, a, sm a small ski resort about 100 kilometers south of Vienna. So in this area, and I'm now here on 1000 meter altitude, you heard that already. And uh, here in, in, in my school, of course, we have this cheese course as well. And if I, and the students are 15, 16 years old, so very young. I have no problem. They taste all of the soft cheeses, of course, all of the fresh cheeses, but not the red culture cheeses and their problem with the blue cheeses, but I understand that. If I wasn't that age, I think I couldn't eat it as well. But just that you know, soft cheese in Austria, especially monastery cheeses. Yeah, the semi-hard cheeses, of course, is um, 
uh, the, the biggest uh, group of all these, I think the most countries produce a lot of semi-hard cheeses because you can, because first of all, the taste is so, yeah, also in the middle somewhere, not too mild, not too spicy, and you can use it in, in, a, in a, yeah, quite big range. That means in the kitchen for salads, for gratinating, uh, for sauces, or just eat it uh, for a snack. And, and so it's very common in Austria. And it's also popular and, and popular and really people buy the semi-hard cheeses most. And of course, that's the reason why they are produced, of course, most. Yeah, and then again, the hard cheeses age from three months to two years, sometimes even longer. But the problem is if like a, a mountain or an alpine cheese is stored over two years, they are really too hard and it's not really enjoyable to eat. Of course, you could grind them uh, like a Parmesan, but it's not the sense of it. Yeah, the Italians make perfect Parmesans and granos, so we don't have to do that. Best mountain cheese is usually over one year, over 12 months, up to 18 months, but not really longer. And then you have the, the, the best effect and, and I think the most fun to eat these cheeses. Good. Let me just explain uh, the Austrian landscape. Just uh, if you just go back a little bit. Thank you. Just a little bit that you see Austria. Many people say it looked like uh, an Austrian Wiener Schnitzel. I don't know if you know the Wiener Schnitzel. I love it. Uh, it's a breaded esculap of wheel usually. Uh, it looks like that a little bit. And let me just start in, in the west parts of Austria. So and on this thinner uh, part here, you have there Vorarlberg. And this is the smallest. Uh, country in Austria and here on the border is Germany and uh, Switzerland and that is the reason why they produce a lot of alpine cheese and Emmentaler. Emmentaler is uh, named in, in North America Swiss as far as I learned it and uh, of course Emmental is a valley it's really Emmental, Tal means valley it's a valley in Switzerland but that is the reason why they do it because they are really connected with them quite much and then it's Tirol maybe you can see Innsbruck this is with this uh, golden roof, this building, Golden Estachli, is it called? And they produce more or less the same, like uh, Vorarlberg, a lot of hard cheeses, Emmentaler, and other specialities. And then we go up to Salzburg. They are producing a lot of semi-hard cheeses. And we say also beer cheeses, that means beer cheeses, that means they match very good with a lot of uh, beer variations. In Austria, we drink a lot of beer. Uh, we are always in the second place worldwide. Yeah, we consume about 120 liters per person per year, every year. That's a lot. Just the Czech, Czech Republic, they drink more, they drink about 140 liters. Um, so we have a lot of cheeses which matches very good with beer. I tell you the truth, for me, I love beer and I love cheese. But uh, for me, uh, com to compare it, cheese and, and beer is very complicated because we have the acidity in the cheese and we have usually the hop and uh, in the beer, especially in Austria, we put a lot of hops in the beer and hop is bitter. And uh, the bitterness from, from the beer and more or less from the milk acidity, for me, it doesn't match. Just blue cheese with some Guinness maybe is okay, but the rest, I don't know. Good, and then just in the south is, is Carinthia, Jagenfurt, maybe you can see this, uh, yeah, it's called, a, it's a warm, more or less, and on the borders there, it's Italy and Slovenia. They also produce mountain cheeses and semi-hard cheeses. Then Styria, they have the widest variation of cheeses, everything from Brie, Camembert to blue cheese. And then we go up to Vienna. Of course, in the city of Vienna, there is no cheese. There is wine around Vienna. Maybe you heard about this. But then there in the very north parts of Austria, uh, um, near to the Czech border, there is a lot of goat and sheep cheese and fresh cheese as well. So you see, it changed, of course, the climate is different. So as I told you before, different varieties of cheeses. Okay, I hope that gives you a little bit of an overview about the Austrian landscape and the cheese variations we have here around. Okay, then we go on to the next slide, please, that you can see. Um, we talked about 450 different cheeses before. Uh, so, of course, there must be something else than uh, the soft cheeses, the semi-hard cheeses, and the alpine and mountain cheeses. Of course, we have, as I told you before, companies which really try out a lot of crazy recipes. For example, we have this elk blossom cheese with uh, edible flowers and herbs from alpine meadows. Very interesting. 
very complicated to make. Yeah, it's always a risk to produce these uh, kind of cheeses, but again, it is special. Then we have the Hayflower Rebel. I remember I had this one this year, I had it in New York as well. The audience loved it, something special. Of course, the flowers, the hayflowers must be pasteurized. It's a, a not an easy um, uh, process to do it, but for these companies, it's more or less to show uh, the people, not just, just in Austria, all over the world, that they are able to produce such cheeses as well, and that the, the, these cheeses are really very tasteable and durable as well. Then we have this Chili Rebel, for example. Also New York this year, Fancy Food Show, people loved it. It's, of course, if you are a very traditional cheese eater, you wouldn't like these cheeses. Yeah, because you see, you want to taste the milk, you want to taste the cow milk, maybe the red culture on it. But again, it's something special and why not uh, on special days eat a Chili Rebel, for example. Then we have this uh, uh, King Ludwig uh, beer cheese, for example, which is also, uh, a cheese they really matured especially for pairing with beer and also in Austria and in Germany, Bavaria, uh, they produce also great dark beers and wheat beers and uh, you can really pair it very well with this King Ludwig beer cheese for example. Yeah and then also you see this Alpine treasure cheese which is very unique cheese with fresh hay milk and then coated by hand with dried juniper and rosemary so also fancy. I just want to explain, I'm not sure if you, if you know about it, about this hay milk. That means it's a law in Austria. If you have it on the label and it labeled on the cheese label and it says hay milk, it's just allowed that really the cows are feeded by fresh hay and grass and nothing else. And that they are really, uh, the cows are out there uh, on the grass and uh, they can move around and so on. So this is the hay milk. Uh, cheese and it's a, a special quality, of course. Okay, so again, this is also what we can do in Austria, uh, yeah, compared to the traditional cheeses. Good. Then we could start already. Yeah, we that was now 30 minutes. That means we have 20 minutes time for the cheese tasting. And I think, and I hope that you are all waiting for for this cheese tasting. And what I want to do is. Of course, taste it with you, describe the cheeses for you, and describe what I think um, is or matches very good with the cheese. We talk about additions then, I explain what it is about cheese, uh, about wine and uh, beer and soft drink pairing, of course, and of course, especially about the taste. I'm not sure uh, how much experience you have about cheese tasting. I'm sure you have it. Um, I do it now since uh, 25 years already, and I always learn and learn and learn from other people as well how to taste the cheeses. I just want to tell you an example. Uh, in two days, we have uh, the Austria biggest cheese tasting in Vienna, and uh, we want to find out the best cheeses from this year in many uh, different uh, uh, categories, for example. But uh, a group of sommeliers gets, for example, 25 cheeses to taste. You have two hours time to taste these 25. And uh, I tell you the truth, that's a lot of work because you want to be fair. You know how much effort these companies uh, put into these cheeses. So you really want to be concentrated and taste and uh, give the right results out of it. But uh, 25 in two hours is hard. But I always learn from the others and say, how do you do it? Because the first five cheeses, six cheeses are no problem. Yeah? And you have really fun to do it. But then it's getting hard work. But important is really to, to, to be concentrated and stay steady concentrated and uh, yeah, give a fair uh, yeah, result more or less to the, to the company. And then I hope the best will win. And they're always from the 25, three winners, of course, from each category, soft cheese, hard cheese, and more. So I just wanted to explain that to you. So tasting of everything, cheese, wine, chocolate, whatever we taste, is something I think which needs really uh, a lot of concentration, not today, please. I would say tonight or in this afternoon for you, it should be fun, it should be pleasure. But as you know, if you taste a lot of cheeses, it's, it's hard work if you really do it seriously. But just that you understand how I do it usually, 
usually I taste cheeses in, in, three, uh, in three steps. First of all, I really want to taste here <clears throat> in the front of the mouse, top of the tongue, and uh, just cue the cheese a little bit, not too long, maybe 10 seconds. And then I think about it, okay, make some notice maybe on the paper, and then I drink a glass of water. Then I take a second piece, try to have the second piece more or less uh, at the end of the tongue, because there we taste a little bit bitter and, and earthy. And then to summarize it a little bit, make some notice, and then I take a third piece, and then I just eat it. And then I just think about it five seconds, and then I make my notices. Usually it's just for me plus, minus, and something else. Either I like it, I don't like it, or it was okay. Um, and, and that's it usually yeah, for, for the tasting. But important is, and for me, these three steps, do it in front, do it in the back, and then just use or just taste one, one whole piece of cheese and then uh, yeah, find out yourself, did you like it or don't you like it? Just that you see that here, that you have it here on one of these slides, the top of the tongue, we taste sweet there, everything for chocolate, of course, it's easy because it's sweet all over the trout, but especially for, for the cheese now, uh, the edges of the tongue, salty, of course, cheese is salty, usually always, so we can uh, quite recognize the aromas on the side very good. Then the middle of the tongue, usually sour, cheese shouldn't be sour, hopefully, uh, otherwise it, uh, yeah, there is a problem or production mistake. And at the end of the tongue, as I explained it before, bitter and earthy. How your tongue uh, perceives flavor is different, of course, for everyone. Uh, that means not everybody is able to taste in the same way. Everybody has different perceptions. I'll tell you the truth. I love degustations in, in the morning, more or less. So around 10, 11 o'clock in the morning, because usually you didn't eat too much. Then if I know I go to a degustation, I drink no coffee in the morning, and I just drink water, I polish my teeth, drink water, go there and taste. I don't smoke, so I have no problem with smoking. Uh, so there is nothing more or less around my mouth, which uh, irritates me. I also don't put some shaving water uh, on my face, really, that all irritates. If you really take it seriously, should be should be nothing on your face, more or less, and your mouth should be neutral. It's very important for me. And in the morning, 10 to 11 o'clock. Now. Uh, even 10.30 in the evening. Not the best time, but I'm hungry already because I had a long day. So I think we just start with the first cheese. So for the cheese degustation list, what I found for this degustation for today, this is enough. I mean, I have, uh, for example, for my students, I just want to show you that. I have a degustation, degustation list. It looks like that, yeah? There is a lot of information and we really describe everything the rind, how does the cheese look from the outside, from the inside, the color, then of course, the holes of different ones, the smell exactly, the taste exactly, and so on. So you need about 10 minutes uh, per cheese if you do it like that. Yeah, but I think it's not the time to do it today. So I thought we just know, of course, which cheese. We start with this rinsing cheese, which is the mildest, then the Mosbacher, and then the last will be the Bergkäse. Usually, we just uh, I just talk about the rind. Is there something special on it? How is it washed? Then the smell, how I feel it, of course, can be different for you. No problem. It's just um, more or less my opinion. Then, of course, the taste. I want to tell you which beverage I would suggest for these uh, cheese, especially a non-alcoholic suggestion and uh, alcoholic suggestion, as well wine or beer. Then different kind of bread. We love to try out uh, different types of bread with cheeses. As, as you know, even uh, not even also in America, that's what I want to say, you have a lot of uh, or a big variety of breads and then uh, you can really find out special ones with them. Also sweet breads with blue cheeses, for example. Perfect. So I want to give you my examples and then these additions. What is this? The additions are for me, especially chutneys, honeys, marmalades for cheeses. I know a lot of cheese lovers and so many say for cheese, please no additions because I want to taste the cheese, of course. But I think with the additions, it can be sometimes a little bit something special if you have friends at home and uh, you offer them, for example, some great honey 
with a mountain cheese and just put a drop of the honey of the cheese, of course, it might be something special for your guests. Okay, so let's start with the first one. So with the Grinzing cheese, I hope every one of you has this uh, beautiful cheese here in front of you. I have mine here and I cut it some pieces off, of course, already. And um, yeah, let's try to, or let's start with uh, the degustation. Uh, the special thing about this grinzing cheese I wanna tell you, it, it was so funny the first time I heard it uh, some weeks ago that it's named grinzing in the United States. In the Austrian market, there is another name for that. It's called Monsia and uh, Mons, Monsee, C means lake is a beautiful lake in two countries in Austria, Upper Austria and Salzburg. And in these two countries, they may produce this Monsea from, from the sea, and uh, they are allowed to use this name Monsea. But in America, I'm sure it was forbidden. And so they named it Grinzing, just that you know what it is. Grinzing is the most famous uh, wine village around Vienna. So the most American tourists, when they are in Vienna, they go to Grinzing and they have a beautiful uh, snack there and drink Austrian wines and enjoy this very romantic atmosphere near the Danube, just that you understand why they named it Grinzing in the United States. Okay. Thomas? Yeah. Thomas, it's Susan. Can you talk about why they're seeing a picture of Green Sink with in on the screen that looks different from what you yeah. we've got to taste? Yeah, of course. Um, that's um, also the production is a little bit different. You see a picture with a cheese and red culture. The cheeses you have, they have no red culture. And um, I heard from the company who makes it, who, who produces it. They said, no, for the American market, they found out that this one sells better. And this is a taste the Americans love more. I hope this is true because the next cheeses we will degustate, they have red culture. This one has no one. That means this one is a milder one. So it's more or less a cheese for everybody. Yeah, that means kids will love it. And also uh, elder people will love it. And you can use it in the kitchen in, for salads and so on. But the reason is that this company found out that for the American market, this variety of cheese without the red culture is better. Okay, good. Yeah, um, let's go on tasting about, yeah, you have the history here a little bit, the flavor profiles and uh, food and wine pairings. This is uh, what the company says, which is of course, correct and interesting, but I just wanna tell you what I would do. First of all, uh, from the rind, of course, it's, it's salt water washed and uh, that's all, yeah? So there is nothing else. They just wash this cheese the first week every day and then the next weeks, um, they just wash it every second day and then uh, from week three to four, just uh, twice a week so that it's not too heavy washed with salt water, that is important. And uh, yeah, I think we just go on uh, tasting. Thomas, we have Cynthia who says she would use the green sink as an ingredient in tartiflette served with a glass of Muller Thurgau. Muller Thurgau, yes. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Miller Turgau is not too, too heavy, not too rich. I think it will match very good. So I, can, I, I think I can uh, summarize this cheese quite quickly. For me, it's an elegant cheese. It's not too intense. Um, quite smooth, I would say. A little bit salty here in the trough, but that's okay. It's a little bit like, uh, I could compare it with, with Gouda cheese a little bit. The taste is aromatic but not too heavy. And uh, for me, I would really suggest to drink a very good quality of milk with it. We love to drink raw milk with these cheeses. It's not so easy anymore to get really good raw milk, especially in the cities. But here, for example, where I work in Semmering, around my school, our farmers, they can bring me the raw milk every day. And when I degustate it with my students, usually, for this cheese, 
raw milk. Um, of course, if I want to uh, drink some wine with it, I would really suggest some light white wine. Uh, I'm not sure if we really should talk about the grape variety. It's always something special because in Austria we have, for example, Grüner Weltliner. I'm not really sure if you know it. Uh, in America, you say already Grüvi. It's a short term for this Grüner Weltliner, which is a very special grape variety for Austria. But um, this would be a light one. More internationally, it would be Riesling. But again, alcohol content not higher than 12%, not more than that. Other, everything else would be too rich. And for an alcoholic uh, drinks, uh, I would offer apple juice. Good. For bread, usually I offer a, a very good crispy baguette. Bread for that matches very good. And additions, no ones, because this uh, cheese is too mild. And I wouldn't uh, offer you any of these, uh, like marmalades or something, not for this cheese. So just a baguette and just a drink with it. And I think you can really enjoy this cheese even every day. Thomas, okay. we have a question from yeah. Sabine. Sabina. What is the age of our cheese sample? I see on the ingredient list, beta carotene. Is that for color? Yes, this one we have here today is uh, six weeks old. Great, thank you. So not really old, of course, but this is not a cheese you store a long time. Now, usually you buy it, you eat it, and uh, you can also just see it here when you, when you see uh, more or less the dough, which is, yeah, very durable, and that's especially how it should be. Yeah, it is a, a very soft and, and, yeah, more or less young cheese, yeah. Okay, any other questions? We can, of course, talk about many things later on, but then I just go on to the second cheese, if it's okay for you. Then we go to this uh, Moosbacher. Ah, here it was. It seems like it would perfect for cheese sauce. Yes, 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 of course. Um, for cheese sauces, and also what I like is, just to you know if you make a, a regular green salad, whatever, put some onions in it, and then you just cut this cheese in little pieces, and put it on, on, on the cheese, it's great. Yeah, I love it. And uh, for a cheese sauce, it's great. Yeah, sometimes, you know, we make just any kind of noodles at home and uh, heat up this cheese and put it on top of it. Perfect, yeah. Good, Moosbacher, something really special. I like it. Uh, you have these samples, I hope also, just in front of you now. You see there are quite some bigger holes in there. You will see when we taste it, this one is richer, of course. Uh, it has also this, uh, it's wrapped in, in a linen, uh, which is more or less just for marketing. Yeah, you don't really need it. But this is something what, you know, we did in our monastery centuries ago. They wrapped uh, especially all the mountain cheeses, all these red cultures, culture cheeses I mentioned before in such a linen cover to protect, of course, the cheese from, yeah, everything, from flies, from other animals. And of course, to keep the dough wet, which is very important, as you know, because otherwise, if you get some sprinkles into the dough, we get bacteria in there and uh, yeah, you have to throw it away. But now this one, Mosbacher, is the most uh, sold Austrian cheese in Germany still. And for Austria, the German market is the most important one, of course, big neighbor, with more or less 80,000 millions living in, in Germany now. So the German market is important, very important. And uh, this one is most selling in Germany, Mosbacher. What is really the speciality about this cheese? Uh, it uh, has a two culture ripeness. That means really here underneath this linen, you have a, a very elegant red culture, not too heavy, but elegant. And then you have also these bigger holes like an, an Emmental, yeah? which is a time of fermentation a process, of course. And these holes and the bacterias, which are in there, probionic bacterias, they make this uh, little sweet and little, we say nutty taste, I hope it's the right word, uh, from this Mosbacher, like Emmental, like Swiss, of course, but richer because it has this red culture here on top. Okay. I think we just taste this Mosbacher now, just that you know also uh, the Mosbacher ripens usually 
minimum six weeks. This one here is what I have here is uh, uh, ripened for eight weeks. You compare a little bit. Uh, if I compare it with the sprinting cheese, you see really very soft because ripened for six weeks. And this one is also soft, but not that soft anymore because ripened for eight weeks. It needs, it needs a little bit longer because this probionic uh, bacteria need more time and they work perfectly uh, just with a 19 to 21 degrees Celsius. I'm not sure exactly uh, in Fahrenheit now, but this is like room temperature, but it needs exactly this room temperature. Otherwise, the bacteria don't work. Good. For the most part, yeah, if you see uh, the rind, as I explained it before, it's washed with water and, of course, with uh, red culture. And if you smell it, and please, if, I mean, we do it in Austria like that. And I always explain it to everybody. If you have a cheese uh, which uh, has a rind on it, doesn't matter which one. If it's Brie and Camembert, of course, with this beautiful uh, white culture on top, uh, and also this red culture, which is just a little red culture, please eat it with the rind. Uh, sometimes I see the people cutting it off, cutting off the rind. I would never do that. Because think about how much affords companies and uh, cheesemakers put on this cheese that we got this beautiful rind. And the most taste is in this rind, not in the dough. So that's the reason why I always eat the dough with a little bit of rind. Okay, so I'm hungry now. I hope you too. I think we just taste the Mosbacher. I tasted this before, of course. So I can go on a little bit quicker. So it's for me very, very nice, very aromatic, but not too intense. But I think compared to the grinsing cheese, it has a, a richer taste on me. So aromatic, tasty. For me, one of the best cheeses we have in Austria. I would again offer some milk, raw milk. I mean, you can really always drink milk with cheese. And of course, if you eat goat cheese, drink goat milk if you get a good one. Perfect. I love goat milk and goat cheese, for example. But today it's cow milk cheese. So milk, then. I would offer a non-alcoholic drink, a pear juice. We have, for, for example, in Austria, we have a, a lot of farmers who produce great, natural, not filtered apple and pear juices. But for this one, I think a pear juice would be great. And then uh, a rich white wine. For example, yeah, in Austria, we have some varieties I think you don't have. Like gelba means yellow muscatella, but you know muscatel, for example, for sure. Or you take Gewürztramina or Pinot Gris, for example, to be international. Pinot Gris, which we grow in Austria as well, of course, originally comes from Italy. Pinot Gris is great for many, many cheeses, of course. And we produce also great rosé wines in Austria. And rosé is always a very good offer and good combination for all cheeses. Not many people offer that in restaurants. I always see white and red wine usually, but believe me, red wine, uh, rosé wine is something great. And then just one more tip, please. Uh, we do a lot of uh, must in Austria, apple and pear must. You would probably say cider, apple cider or pear cider. Um, which matches very good. First of all, low alcohol, you have the fruitiness in these drinks and for those cheeses with this elegant aroma, I think, perfect. Good, bread suggestion. Again, baguette is something you could always offer to cheeses if they are mild or if they are rich, it doesn't matter. But here we use, uh, again, this uh, nut flavor, this nut bread, okay? Good, so a quite a little bit of richer bread, and additions, you could use, if you want to, some kind of chutneys. Sometimes I love to, to taste like a, a mango chutney or, you know, fancy, more or less these, these fancy chutneys, pineapple chutney, why not? But just, again, a drop on the cheese and then together, I think great combination. And then with a Pinot Gris or with a Rosé wine, I think perfect. Okay, I hope you liked and you enjoyed this Mosbacher. Time is even over, but we do the Bergkäse, of course. 
which is the most traditional Austrian cheese. And uh, yeah, there are many big differences. I told you about Berg and Alpine cheese a little bit, the difference. This one uh, is quite a young one because it's just ripened for six months. So it will be not so intense. If you taste this one half a year later, and it's still ripened in the wine cellar, uh, in the cheese cellar, sorry, then of course the, the, the taste gets much, rich, much richer. Good. Mountain cheese, Bergkäse, is the only one from these three which uh, is uh, produced out of raw milk, not pasteurized. The other two are pasteurized cheeses. This one is really raw milk, and it's a law in Austria. Berg and Alpine cheeses have to be produced out of raw milk. Good. The rind is, of course, like the Mosbacher, washed with salt water and usually with a rich uh, red culture. This young one doesn't affect this red culture uh, so much. Yeah. So you will see, but it will be um, richer than, than the Mosbacher. Good. Then smell. Yeah, of course it is. It is intense, and, and for me, this Bergkäse always smells, and I can really see just in front of me, I can imagine, of course, I can't see them. Uh, I can imagine cows just in front of me. If I smell this cheese, it looks so really milky, cow milk, and yeah. So intense, the taste is quite powerful, will be powerful, of course, some months later, but it is quite aromatic. Yeah, I think it has a great quality. You can taste here a really rich aroma here on the trough. It's always a good sign of a good quality of milk, of course. Beverage suggestion for that. Again, milk, I just want to tell you, please, and especially raw milk because it's produced out of raw milk, cow milk. And then, I'm sorry, I have to just eat it. And then something special, what I like is some natural apricot or peach juice. Really try to figure out or try to find out these combinations. Yeah, because this one is quite salty, a little bit spicy. And if you have a, a sweeter juice with it, matches for me very good. Yeah? So apricot or peach juice. And now for the wines, I would offer now really red wine. But the combination red wine with cheese is complicated. I tell you the truth. I remember 1984, I started my career in a great hotel in Vienna, Hotel Imperial. That's the first and official state visit hotel in Austria. Really was really great. And I remember those days, all the sommeliers said, cheese, please, always with red wine. That was almost 40 years ago. Now they change a lot. Usually you don't find very much uh, or not very good red wine and cheese uh, suggestions because the red wine has the problem if it's stored too long in barrels, like in old uh, oak barrels or barrique barrels, the smaller ones, uh, they have such a rich aroma that uh, their aroma from the wine is much too, too strong for the cheese. So what I would suggest with these kind of cheeses Light, not too heavy red wines with around 13 volumes percent of alcohol, not more, and not stored in barriques so and not in the small barrels because they are too strong. Bread, we use for this cheese in Austria, black bread. Black bread is the traditional Austrian bread, yeah, which is rich, which is powerful. I like that for these cheeses. And for addition, please try it out. Choose any kind of honey you like. There are so many different ones. I know that from the, the stores check we did in New York. So many different ones. Find out one or two which you like, buy it, and then compare it with these cheeses. Super. Just put a drop on it, and then, of course, eat it together. And I'm sure you have a, a beautiful combination of uh, cheese with all these additions. Yeah, I know this was very quick and a little bit short, but uh, I think that was planned like that. I hope I could give you the feeling a little bit how important the cheese and the cheese industry for Austria is for 
the whole tourist industry in Austria, for the people in Austria, and that we really uh, love our cheeses and love to promote our cheeses. Okay? So, again, I hope you enjoyed it. And now we have time for questions. Thomas, I have a few comments. Yeah. Um, uh, Erica says about the Mosbacher, it's complex, especially with the rind. Yeah. Really nice. Okay. Um, and sweet and roasty. And then yeah. Cynthia says the Berg, Bergkasse, is that how you say it? Berg, Berg, Bergkasse. Bergkasse. Okay. Uh, I would use the Alpine cheese. It's easier. Alpine. Okay. Yeah. Would be great for people who think Gruyere is too nutmeggy and, or spicy. I think that's yeah. really interesting. Yeah. And then we have a comment, enjoying these cheeses with fruit juice or raw milk is so interesting. I look forward to the pairing. And yeah. I agree, I haven't, I've never occurred to me to try cheese with milk, especially right. raw milk. So. Yeah. It's great, yeah. Yeah. Um, anybody have any questions for Thomas? We just have a, a very few minutes left. Questions, comments. Thank you, such interesting cheese. Oh yes, great question. Where can tourists find out about creameries to visit? And can you name some importers? Yes, Sabina, we're going to be following up with a list of those importers and distributors for you. Um, that'll be coming to you in an email from, from us at Culture in just a day or so. Yeah. And where can tourists find out creameries to visit, Thomas? Yeah, creameries to visit. Usually, I mean, I think we have to send it because there are just a few anymore where really tourists can go, you know? It's like, for example, I know Stift Schlierbach, but it's too complicated to pronounce it now. Yeah, we have to write <laughs> it down. Um, they have a, a showroom, more or less. That means it's a monastery. You go in there and you can see, you know, it's protected from glass. And you walk through, you find descriptions on the glass walls and you can see really downstairs see uh, the monks working but again not romantic how you think how monks look like they have just a regular clothes on it but you can see all the steps how they produce the cheese and watch it from a glass floor more or less but i think i write it down for you yeah two or three important ones which are around vienna and salzburg that would be great and we can include that in the email yeah. sure um Michelle says, all of these cheeses were delicious with the King Arthur sourdough cracker recipe. Do you know <laughs> King Arthur, Thomas? Yes, it's a yes. flour manufacturer here in, sure. in the U.S. Yeah. And we have some nice thank yous. Um, love Austrian cheeses, wines, and food. Thank you. That's so great. That's wonderful. Super. Great. Thank you, everybody. Well, I'm going to say goodbye from Culture. Thank you all for being with us today. It was really interesting and informative. I, I learned a lot and I enjoyed tasting cheeses I've never had before. And I hope you all feel the same way. And uh, as I said, look for that email with which will have some more information and I'll let Thomas say the final goodbye. Oh, one, one more little, little commercial from us. Uh, if you're in the New York area, don't forget our Counterculture Live on October 10th. And you can look for the information on our website under events. Thank you all. Thank you. Great. Good night, Susan. Good, Good night. night. Thank you, Thomas. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.